scripture this morning is Luke 9, verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And they sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command the fire to come down from heaven and consume them? They turned and rebuked him. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord. Let me first say farewell to those of my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. May this reading of his word be blessed and us. Where were you in the summer of 1979? Can't put on that for a while. I remember that summer well. It was the summer after my first year of college. Forty years. Makes me feel really old. But I remember it mostly because of a job that I landed for that summer. I got a job at the Northwestern Publishing Company selling Bibles and other reference books door to door. It's actually exciting because I could have been assigned anywhere in the entire country, including Alaska and Hawaii. Anywhere. I was looking forward to that. They gave us product, copies of all the products we were going to be selling uh, and information about them so we could study about them and familiarize ourselves with them. We even were tested on what we knew about them. They gave us some uh, sales scripts to, to go over and learn, and we uh, role played back and forth and with other more experienced salespeople. So, so we were ready when it came time to put our feet on the ground and go. Before we actually left the area, though, we had a gathering of all those who were hired among the hundreds across the country, all those who were hired from Florida. There were about 75 or 80 of us, and we gathered together in a ballroom in a hotel in Orlando. don't remember which one it was. I couldn't tell you the hotel's even standing anymore. But we gathered there, and of course, as you would expect, it's part pep rally. But we were really there just to find out what our assignments were going to be. So the person who's in charge starts reading off cities and the teams who will be in certain places. And we were in groups of three or four, teams of three or four. Finally, I heard my name, and I jumped down where I'm going. It wasn't Hawaii. It wasn't Alaska. It was really West Virginia. Really West Virginia. I'd never been there. We, our team, the, the four of us got together, there were three rookies, and the more experienced guy who had a couple years under his belt, uh, he was explaining to us kind of what the process was and what we were going to go through and all that kind of stuff, but also told us about his success. In the previous two years, he made enough money and covered all of his expenses for school, tuition, room, board, everything, for the two years, and he bought a brand new car. So I'm going into it thinking, yeah. <laughs> he had never been to Wheeling, so he didn't know anything about it either. Uh, Wheeling, at least back then, was a, was a very beautiful place. 
a picturesque setting in mountains, beautiful place. People were really great people, very kind, polite, welcoming people. But there was a problem. This was Greenland, West Virginia in 1979. If you remember what was happening in 1979, we were in the middle of the biggest oil embargo and recession the country had seen since the Great Depression. And it hit really pretty hard. They were in coal and steel. And I found out after the fact that their unemployment rate was 20 plus percent. Yes. So it was a really economically depressed period. I didn't know any of that going into it, so we get to really kind of buy the map of the city, and I and one roommate are going to cover the city because we don't have a car. Uh, the others had cars, and they're going to be doing the outlying areas. So I had the eastern half of the city. He had the western half of the city. So I, I plan out my strategy. I'm going to go street by street, house by house, check it all off, and I'm ready to attack this with abandon. So we, we start, and I, I'm just going at it. That week, the first week, I visited 300 homes, five and a half days, 12, 14, 15 hours a day. And I, I'm just going at it. And I had a grand total of two sales. I'm not always the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I knew right then I was probably in trouble. And I talked to our team leader and said, listen, this, this doesn't seem good to me. He's like, oh, give me a pep talk. He says, hang in there. You're, you're going you're gonna to have a breakthrough this next week. Okay. On Sunday afternoon, we had a regional gathering. And I talked to some of the regional le uh, leaders, and they gave me the same pep talk and the same line. You're going to have a breakthrough. Everybody starts off slow, then you have a breakthrough. The second, third week, you have a breakthrough. Okay. You know, I don't, I, I don't want to quit, and I don't want to miss a breakthrough. So I go back at it and say, attack it with just as much abandon, put in just as much effort the whole time, and end up with exactly the same results. Two sales, grand total of four. I'm already in the hole as far as cost goes. We've got to pay some rent on the place and everything else. I'm losing money at this point. Plus the team leader again, same cap talk. Regional leaders, same cap talk. I said, okay, I'll give it one more minute. Don't want to miss that breakthrough. So the, the, the third week I'm out there, again, I, I was, I, by the time the third week ended, I had covered about 25% of the city already. I mean, I'm just relentless in trying to cover this. It changed. I made zero sales. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I knew right then, Friday afternoon, I bought a bus ticket home. And I talked to the team leader. And he tried to give me the pep talk and hang. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm already done. I gave my measly four sales to my roommate. And he's going to take care of those from that point on. And I headed back home. I think the uh, regional salespeople thought I had just been loafing around. Because they sent someone else to cover the territory. They didn't tell him anything about it other than, this is your territory. I talked to my former roommate a couple weeks later. He said, uh, this poor guy, he said, they didn't tell him anything, they just sent him to cover the territory, and I just told him, you've got the eastern half. You know, I'm covering this, and you cover that. He said, they would be open the door for him. They would just simply yell out, I already talked to that other guy with that blue case, I told him I didn't have any money. Just go on down the road. You can imagine. There was a lot of rejection going on that summer. I, I came home, and for about four years, I didn't want to knock on anybody's door. Not even family. <laughs> Tough. Rejection's never easy. But we've, we've all experienced rejection in different ways, different times, different scenarios. You could probably go all the way back to, to junior high school and you wanted to, to see a group, that special girl, that special guy, and they said, no thanks. Or maybe you were in a similar kind of situation as to mine and 
you're in business and you got to make those cold calls to other places trying to promote business, and it's over and over again, no thanks, no thanks. Or you've applied for a, a loan and it's rejected, or you applied for a college and your application is denied. All, all different kinds of ways that we experience rejection on a regular basis. I was thinking about it this past week and I thought, I can't think of any positive experiences of rejection. Then I thought of one. If you're familiar with basketball, if you're on defense and you reject someone's shot, that's good for you. Not so good for him, but it's good for you. That's the only positive I could find for any kind of rejection. Rejection is always something that cuts us deep. The book of Hebrews tells us, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. The, the writer tells us that Jesus, our high priest, experienced everything that we experience. That includes rejection. Of course, the ultimate rejection was from the Jewish religious officials and even the Roman leaders that sent Jesus to a cross. Jesus knew what rejection felt like. You can go all the way back to the very beginning of his ministry. There he is in Nazareth. He stands up and he reads the scripture. And he begins to expound it on it. He's preaching on it. And at first, at first like, oh, this is really good sound. By the time he finishes, they're so upset with him that they want to throw him off a cliff. Talk about rejection. At least they weren't trying to throw him off a cliff. They wouldn't open the door. They wouldn't have thrown me off a cliff. Jesus understood that. And so in our Bible reading, Jesus experiences more rejection. See, he's, he's in the northern territory of Galilee. And he's got to go to the southern end of Israel, to Jerusalem. And normally, people in Galilee would travel east, go across the Jordan River, down the east side of the river, and then back over again. And they would do that because between Galilee and Jerusalem lie the territory of Samaria. And the Samaritans and the Jews really didn't get along well. So most of the time, people just avoided it. The Samaritan people often hindered pilgrims trying to go through there from getting to Jerusalem. And so you would expect that Jesus would run into some of that hostility, and he did. We don't know exactly why Jesus said he, he was going to go that way. Uh, John's Gospel says he had to go that way. I'm not sure exactly why, unless it was somehow to teach some lessons, which there were many along the way, both for us and for the disciples, even for the Samaritans. But the Samaritans weren't having any of that. They weren't going to listen at all. They felt as though the Jews had it all wrong. They had Jerusalem as the center of their worship. They not only had the five books of Moses, but they also included these other writings and, and the prophets and so forth. The Samaritans said, we don't have any of that stuff. We've just got the books of Moses. We're pure. The Samaritans said, we're, we're, we're just here on, on Mount Gerizim, not there in Jerusalem. So they had these theological and ideological wars uh, between the two. And in the Bible reading, it says Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knows what's waiting him there. He knows when he goes to Jerusalem, what's going to happen. He's going to face a cross. And he is determined that's where he's going. He's got a mission. He's got a purpose. He's got a ministry. He's going to fulfill it. He's going to proclaim uh, the kingdom of God all the way there and through that cross. Apparently, the Samaritans could sense that about him. They didn't want any part of that. So they, they rejected him. It's almost as if they said, over our dead bodies. How did Jesus handle that rejection? You think Jesus, king of the world, could do anything he wanted. But here he is. It's hard to say exactly how he would have initially reacted because James and John jump right forward. James and John's response is, Jesus, 
Can we call down fire from above and just burn them all up? That'll take care of it. They, they probably had that image of Elijah doing something very similar in their minds. And, and they had already uh, had, of their own, the 12 were sent out into a mission. And they had experienced the great power and authority that Jesus gave to them. So they knew they could do it. But it's interesting to see what Jesus does. He turns to them. It says he rebuked them. He didn't just correct them. He was tough. He nailed them. That's one reaction. Now, the other reaction is to the Samaritan people themselves, which seem to be tolerance. It just doesn't respond to it, so to speak. It's as though Jesus is teaching a lesson to the disciples. It's probably many, one of many lessons that we learn in that simple journey. But here, Jesus is living out his own teaching. If you remember, back in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said we're supposed to love our enemies. He said we're supposed to turn the other cheek. Here Jesus does just that. The disciples haven't learned that yet, though. So they're still acting on a kind of sense of self-righteousness, uh, maybe a little bit of national pride. Could even be hatred for these despised people. But not Jesus. But that rejection is just the beginning. Because along the way, to the next village, there are three more circumstances. The first one, a guy rushes up to Jesus and says, I'm going to go wherever you go. And Jesus, I'm sure, wanting to know that this guy understands what he's talking about, says to him, foxes have holes, birds have nests. I don't even have a place to put my head. I think he wants to make sure this guy takes a good, hard look and what he thinks he wants to be a part of. And he says, just look at me. I don't have a family, I don't have a job, I don't have a home, I don't even have a place to put my head. The animals are more secure than I am. You sure you want to this? And then there's another encounter in which Jesus says to a guy, follow me. This guy says, okay, but i got to do something important for you. And he will bury my father. That's something important. No question about that. In fact, the commandment tells us to honor our fathers and mothers. And to give your father an appropriate burial would be a sacred trust. It's important. But Jesus here seems to consider following him and being a disciple of him as equally important, as equally demanding, as equally urgent. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. You. Proclaim the kingdom of God. Then there's the third person. This person is kind of a mixture between the two. He comes up and he says, I want to follow you. I'm going to go with you. But first, I need to get say goodbye to my family. He, he wants to do it. He's enthusiastic, but he's hesitant. As I say, it's kind of a mixture of the two. It's almost like a, a reenactment of a, of a story between the prophet Elijah and him calling Elijah. We read this as our stack of devotion this past week. And Elijah, the prophet, finds Elijah. And he's out in the field with a team of oxen. And he takes his cloak and throws it over the shoulders of Elijah, which is basically saying, this is my mantle, I'm passing it on to you. You're going to follow me. And Elijah says, I'll go. But first, let me go home and say goodbye to my family. And there, Elijah allows him to do it. Seems to be the right thing to do. But in this case, Jesus does just the opposite. He doesn't even say, go ahead and go home. What he says is, basically, you go, but I'm not going to be there when you get back. You're going to be gone. Are you going to follow, or are you not? He says, anyone who puts a hand in the plow that looks backward, not fit for the kingdom. You know, while you walk forward, you might say, you can't drive forward while you're looking in the rear of your mirror. Same concept. We don't know the actual responses of these three people. The implication, though, is that none of 
them choose to follow. They hear of the hardship, they hear of the, the total commitment that Jesus is asking for, and they all reject Jesus as far as following him as disciples. Now, rejection. Jesus was, in this short passage, rejected by the Samaritans and three individuals. And what does he do? He just keeps pressing on. He keeps moving on toward Jerusalem. It doesn't stop him from his mission and his ministry and his purpose. He keeps moving. He keeps proclaiming the kingdom of God. And he is going where he has to go. As a whole, these kind of help us understand how Jesus handles rejection. He accepts the fact that he's been rejected, but he doesn't stop. He just moves forward. We're not going to experience the same kind of rejection as Jesus did, but we are going to experience rejection. The question is, how are we going to choose to respond? What are we going to do when people reject us because we've chosen to follow Jesus? What are we going to do? When people choose to belittle us because we've chosen to follow the kingdom of God way of life and those standards, what are we going to do? When there are some people who, who look for that moment when we falter, when what we say and do doesn't match what we say we believe, and they use that to attack us and attack the Christian faith in general, what are we going to do? Are we going to be like James and John? And ask God to throw some fire down from the sky and burn them all up? Are, are we going to ask God to somehow hurt them or harm them and slap them so that they get it straight? Are we just going to ask God to set them straight to hell? What are we going to do? That's the question. If we follow the example of Jesus here, we just keep pressing on. We don't let that hinder us from the mission and the purpose that we have. We have good news to proclaim. The good news that Jesus has come and he has set us free. In him our sins are forgiven. In him we have new life. That's the good news that we have to proclaim. We don't let any of those other things stop us or hinder us from that goal, that objective. This Thursday, we're going to celebrate our country's independence. Actually, the declaration of our independence, because our actual independence didn't come for a while. But we declared we were going to be independent, our forefathers did, from England and its modern. 243 years ago, our forefathers rejected that form of government and, and began something completely new. It wasn't perfect, still isn't perfect, but it's a much closer approximation of what God declares us as human beings to be and the freedom that we truly have. Where it says that we have certain unalienable rights among those our life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are kind of different things. I'm thankful that we live in a country where we can follow our faith, where we can live out our mission and our purpose, where we can proclaim the good news. And we can do that for you. Because the country gives us a certain taste of freedom. But in Christ we have complete freedom. Think about that this week. Remember that this week. Celebrate this week. Praise God and thank God this week. And God gives us that freedom. We might be rejected. That's okay. 
Because there's someone who's already accepted us. And we know that. And we live in that love. And we live in that love. So don't let the rejection stop you. We have the freedom. And we have the mission to continue to proclaim the good news. It's who we are. That's what we're about. That's what really makes us free. Our precious God, we thank you. We thank you for including us in your work, including us in the mission and purpose. Thank you for including us in your outreach to the world. Thank you that you have, through your Son, given us freedom, that we truly thank you for a country that allows us to exercise that. Help us now to do just that, to live out that freedom. And when others reject us, help us to react just as Jesus did, with a compassion, with an understanding, not with anger and vengeance to know that your truth wins out no matter what. Because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are God of all. And so help us to commit ourselves once again, even as we celebrate the freedom of our country, to celebrate the freedom that you give to us. And help us to stay on that mission. Help us to continue to proclaim the good news that you give to us through Jesus, that we are truly